What's happening, people? Back with my week later reflection on the AHA uh -huh movie. And before I really get into this, I apologize. I've taken a lot of notes, so this may take several minutes, maybe 10 or more. Either way, um, I will at some points have to take a sip of tea. I normally try to like not do that while I'm talking before a reaction or after, which is why I tend to drink my tea more steadily during a song. Because I always feel like it's very indulgent to like, if you have someone's attention, to then take a sip of something or, you know, spend time doing something physical because they're just waiting for you to talk. It's just like, okay. Uh, and I'm thinking of a scene from a, a show I'm quite fond of where someone in the middle of a sentence pauses to light a pipe and everyone's just like, we just have to wait because he's in the middle of a sentence. So I apologize. There'll be a few times where I'll just have to interrupt myself for a short while uh, because again there will be a lot of talking here so yeah ultimately I first wanted to once again give a big shout out to Graham for sending me um, the DVD I could probably you know have gotten the movie from different people and shout out to all the people who've been sending me you know files of their music and presumably at some point you know there may be some documentary or some you know video that's um, not on YouTube either way um, it meant a lot that I was able to get an actual DVD of it I was at I have an actual copy of the movie myself so big shout out to you as well as to all the AHA family who had encouraged me to give this um, a watch and who you know said it would be an enjoyable thing to talk about which it absolutely has been and indeed a uh, shout out to those who've been patient for the uh, uh, reaction video here or the the thoughts about the film video here because again when I watch something when I listen to something I tend to let it sink in for a little bit I tend to like to think about it and you know that's the case for a five minute song never mind an hour and 45 minute movie uh, covering 35 plus years of a you know multi-album catalog and personal history of a band so um, number one, I've just been letting things sink in a little bit more. I did go back and rewatch some parts just to, you know, brush up on exactly what people were saying in some different moments. Uh, so yeah, the first thing uh, I want to start with is related to my choice of when to do it. Now again, I was trying to get so many things done through the holidays and I ended up getting sick, maybe in some cases because I wasn't always getting like a full night of sleep because I was trying to keep up with you know, not only the regular reactions right up until about the week before my birthday, but then a number of holiday related things. Bottom line, I probably should have waited a little bit longer because now when I see the video, I like, you know, I've watched parts of my reaction to it or my watch along with it and I sound very sick. Like, I don't know if it comes across to everybody. I know there's some people who've said they can definitely hear it. Um, but yeah, ultimately it annoys me a little bit now because I, I just sound terribly congested. So I apologize for the way that I sound during the video. Um, I also should have tested out my mic on another video first. Um, it, I got a brand new mic, you know, I spent a little bit of money to get a much better mic than the one that I've had, which is a very simple mic. It does the job, it's fine, you know, I've used it for... Um, the riffs, I've used it for the video game playthroughs, um, and more recently the watch-alongs and video reactions. But yeah, I splurged, I got a much better mic, but you know, I'm brand new to using it, and the old one, like, I kind of have to get very close to the mic, I've learned that this new one, you don't have to get that close, and indeed there's some moments in the watch along where the mic gets very hot, so I apologize. Um, again, I'm still learning how to do these things, it's, you know, it's all DIY over here, and um, although maybe not a complete technological dinosaur, I'm certainly not a uh, technological wizard, so... Um, nevertheless, uh, to begin with the actual discussion of the film, I will say it was really nice to get the actual origin story, both for the band more generally and for the individual guys. Obviously, they start those stories at about, you know, their pre-teen years, like 10, 11, 12, and so on. Uh, and indeed, we learn that by that age, uh, Paul and uh, Mags were already getting involved musically, eventually, you know, becoming part of a band. Uh, you know, playing for their classroom, we heard, was the first uh, show. So, yeah, it's cool to get some of that history in detail. Going through the deep dive of AHA's catalog, I've heard bits and pieces, I've heard parts of these stories that will play out over the course of the film. Um, but again, it's nice to see some direct comments from the guys themselves, some footage, including, you know, um, footage of the the places in Norway they grew up and the you know the commentary about Norway and the perception of its musical culture both internally and abroad and <clears throat> getting a lot of 
like geographical and socio-cultural context for the environment in which those guys came of age and were keen to follow their musical ambitions, which, you know, we hear especially from, you know, about Paul and Mags, like very early on, they wanted to just as soon as they were done with high school get to London and start immersing themselves in culture, more on that in a minute. Um, but yeah, it was also nice to get a sense of their personalities through the film. Obviously, any documentary, um, it's not going to tell you the full story, and you know, no one, you know, not to get into like <coughs> Jungian um, psychology, but you know, you have perceptions inside your own head that people aren't privy to, but also they can see you in ways that you'll never be able to see yourself. So, you know, it's arguable that no one fully knows any other person um, in a 360 degrees, every single percentage uh, respect. But obviously, a lot of their personalities does come across over the course of the film. Um, now, you know, I don't think there's any one of them that immediately stands out to me as, oh, I definitely get along with him better than the other two. Indeed, I tend to get along with most people. Like, you know, I suppose there's been people in history where it's like, God, I can't stand that guy. But generally speaking, those have been very anomalous situations and people. Um, so I feel like I could have a, you know, really engaging conversation with any of them should that opportunity arise. But yeah, ultimately, it's interesting to hear Paul talk about being very socially anxious and uncomfortable in interviews, and there's that one point where he's talking about that, and they're showing footage from an old interview, and they're kind of focusing in on him, and you can see, like, squirming, uncomfortable, kind of like, you know, looking at the camera, like, okay, so you can definitely feel what he's talking about in that moment. So number one, I think that's a very well done part of the documentary, but it's surprising, because, you know, you think about... People, and especially Paul, who, you know, has talked about from the very earliest age, imagined himself as a rock star, playing the parts he was hearing, and, you know, eventually getting some adulation in his early concerts, and, you know, like, oh, man, we've made it, you know, the girls are screaming for me, and so on. So knowing that he had that drive to essentially be like a rock star, or at least a pop rock star, um, it is interesting to hear how all the trappings that typically go along with that made him uncomfortable, made him a bit uneasy and he was again happy as was Mags to have Morton sort of step into the spotlight or perhaps even better have the spotlight thrust upon him. I like how I'm just going completely off script here. I spent like hours writing this and now I'm just like whatever. Um, but that again makes me uh, think of something Shell said and shout out to Shell once again awesome friend of the channel recently joined on Patreon. I really do appreciate that but she was saying that like because I commented during the scene where Morton's being interviewed I think it's in the 90s and the woman is making jokes like, oh, you know, what's it like, you know, being, you know, so handsome and so on. And like, you know, would you take off your shirt for me? And he sort of quips back. And I think it's, again, as I said in the watch along, a clever way to like point out the inappropriate nature of her question. He's like, oh, well, as long as you do. Um, but Shell was saying she's seen the extended, in <coughs> extended interview and that she's like really inappropriate the whole time. She's almost talking to him. I think she said like as if he's a piece of meat and just constantly kind of like clumsily flirting with him. And she just said the whole thing is like uncomfortable. And given that that's probably not the only time that happened, it's probably not the only time that he was approached or interacted with. It's just, you know, as if, oh, you know, you're this amazing, sexy person. And like, what's it like being like that? Whereas again, you know, he's approaching things he talked about very early on you know he's playing piano and he wanted to be a musician and a singer so don't get me wrong like seeing the part where they're talking about him you know trying all different looks different costumes putting paint in his hair instead of hairspray it's obvious he was very much you know keen to generate a certain look or to explore visual creativity um you know like i don't mean to sound cynical like it you know part of it may just be like i like trying different costumes i like dressing outrageously i like doing these things which you know they were inspired by soft cell and i have a point coming up later maybe that i'll get to in you know an hour or something um about how one of the things that i love is how they talked about being inspired by soft cell and Soft Cell, I get it, it's a very different type of 80s group with very different types of songs, but um, they embrace the audacious and they embrace the, you know, marching on their own path and, you know, just being colorful and memorable in a crazy way. Um, and so if I praise Mark Allman for that, it feels weird to then say that, oh, but Morden, you know, trying different hairsprays and, you know, putting all these weird costumes on. It's, you know, I don't... 
I don't view that cynically and I feel like, you know, I don't hold um, his desire to try to, on some level, take hold of this burgeoning, you know, interest in his appearance and his appeal and so on. Um, but I do also understand the other guy saying that, like, number one, you know, it was crazy and funny when he gave Paul a makeover and generally speaking, we weren't so much into that and we were happy to have him kind of be out there doing that. Though again, it immediately speaks to the way that the band was, members of the band were having different experiences even as they were going through the same periods and the same material. More on that maybe eventually. Uh, so they try to get back to the script, and indeed, I apologize, here's the first instance. I wish I could put like a sound effect there, just like a, please wait one moment. Uh, in any case, um, what else did I say? Uh, oh, okay, so yeah, so, you know, essentially their personalities do come across, you know, different styles and demeanors. Obviously, who they may have been as people in the 80s is not necessarily who they are in the 2010s. I'm sure I'm the same person that I was uh, when I was younger, uh, but ultimately, you know, you learn and you maybe change in your demeanor a little. Like, I'm just, you know, I'm a little less crazy than I was when I was 18, 19, 21, and even if ultimately, you know, there are aspects where there's continuity between the way I think and act now, um, I'm definitely a more mellow and wizened person compared to how I was in my 20s. So. Yeah, to hold anyone to this universal standard, no matter what age they're at, or to like try to extend who they were at one point in time to who they are throughout that whole period, you know, it feels like that's unfair because we're all human and we never, you know, for the most part, I'm sure you could find some people who just stubbornly, like, they're just going to remain the same. But most people, they're not static, you know, they are dynamic over time. Um, so yeah, it was also interesting to see how important Heidi and Lauren were to, or are, uh, to Mags and uh, Paul respectively, um, and interesting to know that they've had that anchor for so long, whereas Morton hasn't so much had that anchor, and indeed, where, what did I say exactly about this? Um, and oh yeah, okay, so, and that ties into my previous point, like, it makes you wonder, because Morton was not, you know, known to be married and, you know, unlike Mags, you know, was not um, in a long-term relationship with his childhood sweetheart, one wonders whether the media treatment, like, I get it, it's his physical appearance, he's just very attractive, but if he was publicly known from, you know, the first time that they came up to be, like, very much in love and married to his childhood sweetheart and they had this great relationship, I wonder if the media treatment would have been the same. I wonder if he would have gotten quite as much, oh my god, you're the sex symbol. It's like, you know, there are like handsome and attractive people <clears throat> in different walks, you know, in um, celebrity entertainment life, not just music, but actors and so on, but they're known to have a relationship. So it's like, okay, they're known like, oh, one of the sexiest people and you know, whatever, but they don't necessarily get, like, fawned over in interviews and so on. So I wonder whether, if he was anchored in that way, the way that Mags and Paul were, if the media attention to his appearance would have been quite the same. I'm sure there would have still been attention to it, it still would have been a, you know, he's a sex symbol, but um, I just wonder if it would have been the same intensity and the same persistence if Again, it was just known that, well, but yeah, you know, he's, he's taken, he's with, you know, his sweetheart and so on. So yeah, it seems like the, the disparity in media treatment might have been for multiple reasons, like not just <clears throat> because he has this look, but also because his situation, you know, was sort of publicly different from that of his two bandmates. Um, so, so again, try to get back on point here. Um... Okay, so yeah, so I'm not sure, is that right? Yeah. Um, I did enjoy seeing the different groups that inspired them. Again, that, like, what was it, Raya Deep? Um, I never even heard of that artist, but the song they played, it's like, damn, that's like a crazy, progressive, classic rock type of, um, you know, like, raging guitar type of tune. It sounded very interesting, so um, that was a cool... Uh, thing to learn about through them. Once again, I find it really fa fascinating that they were inspired by Soft Cell, and um, I consider that a cool connection. Ultimately, the fact that Paul was inspired by Echo and the Bunnymen, I, number one, it's like, I enjoy that because I've come to very much enjoy that group as I've gone through their music, and I've been going through their early stuff, 
And it makes a lot of sense that Paul likes them because their early stuff is very, like, edgy, post-punk. It's a bit like pop rock, but it has an edge to it. There's some tracks that are, again, they're very, like, in the punk domain. Uh, so the fact that he always wanted to be a bit more of a rock band, a bit more of a, like, we're not about magazine covers and image. We're more about grit and substance, and, you know, it doesn't matter what we look like, and his whole, you know, he talks about that concert of Echo and the Bunnymen where they flooded the stage with light, so you essentially see three silhouettes playing a song. Um, yeah, it's, it's telling to me, and again, going back to the social anxiety thing, it's like all the different pieces start to make more sense when you see a film like this, and you get a sense of who they are as humans, and, you know, again, I have a point about this later, but... Um, one of the things that comes across is the humanity of all three guys, and, you know, I'm jumping ahead in the script here, uh, I'll get back to this, but I do agree with what a uh, great friend of the channel, uh, Sophia, said, where she feels like, you know, they're all right, like, you know, she understands they have disagreements and so on, but they all kind of have justifications for why they feel the way they do, um, I think, and based on, you know, what Sophia said, and I think what a lot of people have said, they think on some level all of them are trying to do the best for AHA. And they may not always agree on what that is, but they're very much trying to do the best for their band um, in those disagreements. And so, again, I sympathize with that notion that they're all right, even if, you know, that sometimes things are factual, sometimes there's empirical truth, but at the same time, the way that looks, it depends on what angle you're looking at it from. So... Um, I do very much appreciate that concept. Um, but yeah, so I was a bit surprised about the amount of time they spent um, post-contract with Warner Brothers before they started to actually get the songs that we would hear on Hunting High and Low. And it's interesting, you know, I'm going through some of the demos. I still have a lot more to go through, but I'm going through those early demos and I'm listening to the audio and I'm thinking, ah, oh, the exploration, finding their sound, like, you know, coming to figure out what works, maybe what doesn't as well. Yes, that's what they were doing, but there's a human side to that too, right? They're poor. They're going from better apartments to smaller apartments because they're just not making money. They're working with some different producers because they feel like they're not really making progress and maybe the label is eventually getting impatient and, you know, ultimately if you go a couple years and you still have no album to show for it, you're not going to be on the label too much longer. So the, the human side, the pressures, the anxieties, and the worries that, like, is this really going to happen? I'm not thinking about that when I'm reacting to the demos. I know the story. I know that it did happen. I know where they end up. So you see that, you hear them talk about those early days, and okay, sure, we understood on some level that, like, there was going to be a bit of that, you know, eating porridge and so on, but they made a point, they couldn't ask for money from, you know, family back in Norway, because it would basically be admitting, like, we didn't make it, and now, like, you know, we're stuck and we need help. Um, so yeah, again, I feel like I'm just, like, I'm walking all over my script. Um... Uh, the human side of that, and they were fairly poor. Uh, presumably a fair number of bands, and that, that's a good point. Um, that's a, did I just praise myself? I hate myself. Um, but yeah, presumably there are a lot of bands that get to that provisional stage. An A&R guy reaches out, hey, you know, we saw a local concert of yours. We think you got a lot of talent or a promise. We're going to bring you in. They get them in the studio. They work with some experienced producers nothing's really working, hmm, this song's okay, but not really an album here, maybe not even an EP, and then eventually it's like, yeah, sorry, contracts run out, and that's it, we're, you know, we're not going to re-sign you. So I feel like a lot of bands probably get there. Not all those bands actually make that first album. Even fewer still have that album hit enough to justify a second album, and even fewer still, of course, go on to have many successful albums. So what it got me thinking, um, and, and indeed that happens, you know, even when bands have talent, again, it's not that Mags and Morton um, and Paul didn't have talent, like when they were, you know, they couldn't quite figure out, you know, Morton doing the Rooster Crow, okay, we thought it was funny, but maybe, you know, that's not going to be something that's just going to make it hit. Um, they all still had talent, you know, Paul, you know, shredding guitar and... Mags had become proficient and started to, you know, produce some really interesting melodies on the keyboards. Morden, you know, had a great voice from the beginning and, you know, the the 
for one of the first producers they worked with talked about that. Like, oh, you know, you could tell that they, there was something going to happen. You know, they all were enthusiastic for it, and Morton's voice was like the cherry on top, and so on. Um, but I bet you there's a lot of groups that they had talented members. They had like the the raw materials to be something, but they just couldn't quite put it together or make that one song to let everything else unfold. And in that regard, I think whatever one thinks about Take On Me in retrospect, whatever one thinks about it musically compared to some of their other tunes, <clears throat> and however vexing it may be, and shout out to Shell for giving me a great example of this recently, uh, but however vexing it may be, when folks who are more casual fans of that song, or even indeed passionate fans of that song, but not so much Aha uh -huh, the Group, um, as frustrating as that may be, I think the real beauty of Take On Me is it broke that door down. It allowed the, the waterfall to come through and it gave us through what it became and what it enabled and what it then laid the foundations for um, is everything that I've come to love about the group and that many of you have been loving about the group for decades. So, um, again, even if its place in their history is a bit of a albatross hanging over the band, even if it's a bit of a weight on the way that they're perceived and perhaps even on the individual band members and you know if someone mentioned that Mags, oh apparently I peaked when I was 15 I didn't realize um, whatever they all think about that I think we can all love the song for making aha's path to what they are um, insured I guess uh, how did I, I probably worded this a lot better um, but yeah, maybe because of Take On Me, that didn't happen, meaning they didn't almost make it, but not make it. Uh, and instead, we get more than 35 years of musical and artistic brilliance, and that, despite it hanging over the band, um, like Banquo. So in my, like, freestyle, I go with Albatross. In my written reference, I go, or in my written material, I go with a Shakespeare reference, uh, is a valid reason to love the song. Well, I agree with you, Shanice, even though you're a bit pretentious. Uh, I will agree also with a great friend of the channel, uh, Michaela, that the film seems a bit unbalanced in terms of the time spent with the different albums in the different eras. Now, I get it. Like, it's an origin story. So, and not only is it an origin story, but AHA is perhaps most famous for their massive hits of the 80s. Um, so it makes sense on some level that you spend comparatively more time with the earlier albums in the 80s material, but it still feels like there's so much time spent there, a middling, still pretty short, but middling amount of time spent with the 90s material, and then they just rush, sprint through, and don't really spend specific individual time on the the 2000, the Aughties albums, or, jump ahead, uh, cast and Steel. Now, obviously, Foot of the Mountain they talk about a little bit more, though even then it's primarily about that tune itself. We hear nothing of the lovely bandstand. Uh, nevertheless, um, so uh, before we get there, I will say, or finish off that point, um, by saying it felt a tad unbalanced, even if the level of interaction of the band may dictate that to some degree, meaning like, you know, post Foot of the Mountain, they're, they're not spending all that much time together, so you can't, like, you know, they got what they could as they're preparing for the acoustic performance for the MTV Unplugged album, and ultimately, it just, you know, you have less to work with because of the way the band has developed interpersonally um, and situationally. Uh, but even so, I still felt like it, they could have spent a little more time on the 2000 albums. It just felt, like, a bit rushed in that regard. <clears throat> and the whole thing about insisting, like, okay, so Manhattan Skyline, you all know, I absolutely love it, still probably my favorite AHA tune, probably always will be, I just, it's brilliant, it's like, it is an utter masterpiece, one of the best songs of the 80s, like, you know, I put it up against any other song from that era, which is, you know, I'm listening to a lot of good music from the 80s on my channel, so that is in no way a small compliment, um, but the idea that, like, somehow them insisting on making that a single, which I would have absolutely, like if I was in the band or if I was someone who was advising the band in a producer or like a promoter role, I absolutely would have been on, like yes, that should be a single, that should be one of the, like if not the lead single, that should be one of the like 
real hits, like everyone's gonna love it. So the idea that them insisting on that made them lose the US market is crazy to me. Now I get it, people have mentioned, not just in relation to AHA, but in relation to some other groups that I've been going through, that in the US in the 80s, if you were a European or like British group, you had to have synths, you had to be like an electronic group because that was what was determined to have made it from Europe in the US. So again, you had Depeche Mode and Duran and so on. So if you had that type of sound, it was seen as ideal. But here's the thing, there were a lot of rock groups and there were groups including like, you know, U2 would eventually make it big in the US and they were, I realize like over time they've incorporated different elements, but their first several albums, it's like rock music. So it's crazy to me that like, oh, well, yeah, see, they insisted on making Manhattan Skyline a single and because of the sound of that tune, it lost them the US market because everyone expected them to sound like Take On Me, which again, the Albatross or the Banquo, I get how it's not so simple as just, well, hey, it paved the way. Well, yes, but it's the shadow of it remains. So I do get that, but it's crazy. Like, it's a brilliant tune. So I just, it boggles the mind. I genuinely don't understand. And the song has keyboards. It's not, you know, they, they have a bit of a harpsichord sound and so on, but it has a synth sound, like at least in, you know, the, the offset part of the tune. So... Um, yeah, I just, I can't wrap my head around why uh, that song, being a single, meant that suddenly American music goers cared a lot less about AHA. It's just uh, incomprehensible. Uh, so yeah, play the music again. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Um, see, this is what was happening. My, my handwriting got so bad. Oh, okay. Yes, I agree with Hero of the Channel. I was a hearer of the channel. I agree with Hero of the Channel, Graham. Uh, we were talking, uh, like, I was, like, very, like, it was immediately after, um, you know, within, like, the first 24 hours or something of seeing the movie. But he was commenting on the John Barry situation, and I was saying, I absolutely agree. Like, number one, you don't always get to be a dictator in collaborative processes. You know, like, even if you're the best player on a soccer team, and you have ideas about formation or strategy or whatever, you know, there's 11 players on the pitch and, you know, you probably have a technical director, if not like a formal head coach, like you, there has to be a meeting of the minds and there has to be some compromise and some negotiation when it comes to what the final idea is, the final plan is. So the idea that he just changed a bunch of chords in the song and then just essentially told them record it that way. It's like, it just feels dictatorial and completely inappropriate. Like you commission them to create a song for the film well, then they have to have some, not only some measure of creative input, but some level of involvement in the final say. And if Paul, you know, felt very strongly about those chords and, like, the idea that, like, suddenly it's going to be their song, but it's not going to sound the way they wanted it to, it's crazy to me. And so, like, number one, I um, give them credit for standing up to him by just, like, we're going to record it the way we want to record it, even if that means changing something that he insisted on changing in the first place. Um, but I think it's crazy that, you know, in public interviews and so on, he's like, oh, well, you know, they were nasty about the way they dealt with that. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, you need to look in the mirror because I think, you know, you've been the kingpin for so long that you've kind of forgotten what it's like to collaborate. Like, to collaborate means something different to you than it should. Um, so again, uh, shout out to Graham and to others who, you know, felt like, hey, you know, it's just, his attitude about it seemed to be disproportionate. And my favorite part was when... They brought it up to Mags and he was like, all right, so we're going to get into it? Okay. <laughs> I like the sort of um, wry response to bringing that up. <clears throat> so as for the band's creative process, uh, it was really interesting to see it in practice. Again, you think about it, it's like, okay, so Paul writes a lot of the songs, Mags, Mags writes some songs, and you know, they di different melodic parts are contributed you know, by different members. Um, but seeing that in practice, again, it's different than just hearing about it and you begin to understand the substance of it. Um, and ultimately, you know, hearing about the varying levels of gravity in the studio, if you will, obviously there, Mags and Morton were saying that Paul was sort of, you know, maybe not heavy handed, but definitely keen to get his vision across in the studio to the point of, you know, maybe impressing his views on others. 
<clears throat> at certain points, and it was funny as they're talking about this, where he, like, Morton's kind of working with what I assume was like a script of the, the lyrics or something, and Paul just kind of, you know, unthinkingly just sort of grabs it out of his hand, starts changing something, and Morton was sort of like, <laughs> you did like, just like, okay, I guess I'll wait to get it back then. Um, and yeah, ultimately, it, you know, force of personality, again, to go back to the soccer thing, it's like, even sometimes the player who might be scoring the most goals, like, he might not be the most vocal on the pitch, or he might not be the most, like, strategic, and so the idea that, like, the best talent is always going to be the one making the decisions, it's, you know, it's more complicated, and again, when your talents are in different areas, or if, you know, crossover, but, like, ultimately, personality does absolutely come into it, is I guess what I'm saying, like, it's one thing about the art, it's one thing about the collaboration, but ultimately, you know, sometimes someone just being a bit more forceful and insistent, and again, there's the dynamic of the Mag's little brother, Paul, older brother, so there's a, a long-standing personal history that may influence the way these interactions happen in the studio, so again, you get a, an origin story of the guys in the group, suddenly little conversational moments there's a lot there that you may not otherwise recognize once you start to get the story. Um, so yeah, ultimately, um, I'm symp I sympathize uh, with the level of relative, and that's, yeah, so that the point I was trying to make here is that for all this talk, um, which I, I agree with and I totally understand, but a lot of people have been saying, you know, it's like we now realize like how much they've gone through, how much struggle there's been to get the beautiful music and catalog that we've got, or that we have gotten. Um, but in a way, it's almost like, you know, I'm impressed by how much cohesion there has been. It's like, you know, I played on some different teams, not only football, meaning soccer, but ice hockey as well. And like, over time, like, you know, different people come and go sometimes because they just, you know, don't end up, you know, getting along with other people on the team. So they're just, you know, they go looking for another team or whatever. And like, you know, some of these teams that I was on last like four or five years and then now oh, we're going to disband and I end up going playing for another team and so on. I mean, at the time of filming the, the film, filming the film, uh, at the time of the documentary, um, you know, they've been around 35 plus years. They've since made another album after that. Ultimately, um, the level of cohesion is perhaps maybe not... Um, less than I would expect, but like more than I would expect. It's hard to get along with people in a creative enterprise where ideas are sometimes rejected or at least remodeled and so on. And again, we'll get to the foot of the mountain thing in a minute. Um, and indeed, I suppose <clears throat> that is fair, fair to say that like the cohesion of the group certainly has a notable speed bump and things, you know, because of the foot of the mountain experience, you can say that like, you know, that shook the band more than, you know, a normal conflict over, you know, creative involvement in a particular tune, um, and maybe that genuinely put it into a bad place. Um, but again, I think on the whole, and certainly from the 80s up to the Foot of the Mountain incident, um, I think it's actually impressive how cohesive they remained, even having different, you know, again, Morton saying, and, you know, people commented that, like, it's interesting, like, I wonder, did he really feel that way at the time, or is it something that he's come to that opinion over time? But you remember him saying that, like, he didn't like the direction the band was going in the 90s, as if they were trying to be a band they weren't, but he didn't, you know, not sing the songs, he didn't, like, you know, just leave the band because, no, 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 like, I'm just going to do only solo stuff now. So, again, I give them credit for staying around um, to the degree or staying together to the degree that they have. Uh, but that does bring us to the foot of the mountain incident, and I definitely need a sip now. Uh, so, yeah, to begin addressing this, I'll first say I do agree with great friend of the channel, Sophia, as I mentioned earlier, that they are all right. Uh, I'm just going to read straight from my script here. Uh, and that's not an unqualified endorsement of, you know, like, relative truth or anything. I just, just an acknowledgement that experiences don't always seem the same from every vantage point. 
and everything the guys, um, everything I've seen from the guys tells me that they genuinely care about the group and they're trying to steer it in the best way that they see fit, even if it's not always agreed upon what that should be. <clears throat> As for my specific take on the incident, um, I won't repeat what I said in the film too much because again, I, you know, one of the parts that I rewatched of my own watch along was the part where they talk about that. Um, and I do think, you know, for an immediate response, I process what I was thinking reasonably well. So if you haven't, like, actually seen my watch along, I would say watch that first. I guess, you know, you're 15 minutes or whatever this is into this, so um, I guess it's too late. But um, I won't repeat too much of what I said there. Uh, but I do totally understand Paul's reluctance to put a chorus he cared so much about. Um, as he does with all of his musical creativity, clearly, which, you know, it's something that Lauren talks about in the documentary, also, as I was mentioning to Lori recently, I love both of them, like, they just, number one, like, Paul cares so much about his music, I love that Lauren has known that from day one, and felt like she had to keep up with him, it was either sink or swim, you know, she had to become a musician and a performer, or it maybe wouldn't work, um, so yeah, I love them both, they are fantastic. Um, but I absolutely do understand his reluctance to put a chorus that he cared about so much into a song that, in the verses, is essentially attacking his character. Um, but I also understand Morton and Max thinking it was for the good of the group, and that a meeting, um, of minds is like what they had done in the past, and their ability to like, hey, we need to compromise on this and that. So, as I said again in the watch-along, I don't blame the producer for making the suggestion. I don't blame Mags and Morton for thinking that it was a good idea and that it might be a hit song, which we now know it absolutely turned out to be. But I absolutely understand Paul saying, wait, like, this means a lot to me. I don't want it to be part of a song that has that legacy. Like, I don't, you know, it's a, it's a personal song. Okay, well, the group's gonna end. Okay, well, I don't want to end the group, so I guess I'll back down. I, it's like you know, back down is what he did in practice, but in a way it's like, would would he really prefer to terminate the group? Clearly not. So, um, again, I, I think they all had valid points of view when it comes to this unfortunate incident that, you know, I think we can all agree it would have been nice if it didn't play out that way. <clears throat> As for the songwriting thing, and I'll give a shout out here to Eleanor, who uh, commented that she agreed with my assessment in the watch along where I was saying that, look, you know, when I first started reacting to AHA, uh -huh, one of the things that immediately stood out to me was the dynamic, vivacious synth bass lines, and a lot of the keyboard work was like really vital to what I enjoyed. So to me, you know, contributing a melodic riff, a top line as Mag talks about, or like a really dynamic synth bass, that's not just a napkin on the table to me. That's not a flower in a pot on top of the table. That's a leg. That's part of the table. That's part of the creation. At the same time, I completely respect that Paul's approach to songwriting, it's, it's more robust, it's more comprehensive, and he's saying, you know, it's not about just this part here, or that part here. It's about building a full song that is meant to be together in all of its um, arrangement. So, um, I completely respect different perspectives on songwriting and ultimately, you know, as someone um, who's been interested in sampling and music and, you know, it's like, okay, so then, you know, a song that immediately comes to mind is Fuji's Ready or Not. Well, it samples the Enya song, what is it, Bodecha? I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's like, it's a great song originally. And then what they do with it in that treatment is fantastic. So it's like you give credit to the original, but you also give credit to someone who's found a way to take that and do something really cool with it. So, you know, the the debate over songwriting, I suppose, is best left for those who are getting official songwriting credits. But I will absolutely agree with what that producer said. It would have been, or I don't know if it was producer, I think it was like a manager. But he was saying that, you know, it's a shame that they didn't settle on the U2 model. The idea of like, okay, any song we do, we all get credit, and that's it. Um, so, you know, if there's one regret, if there's one reluctance, um, in, or not reluctance, but um, disappointment in terms of the way that the, the group came together in terms of the, like, official, you know, songwriting credits, it's a shame that they didn't make that arrangement. Now again, I get it, if you feel like your 
and, and, and that's just the point, right? Because I was going to say, like, I know Paul thinks, um, you know, that writing a song is a certain level of contribution or creation. Um, but again, like, if Mags wouldn't have felt undervalued and underappreciated in terms of what he was being credited with and being acknowledged for, you know, in terms of royalties and so on, maybe there's not so much tension in the group. Maybe there's not so much big brother, little brother, like, you know, um, entanglements. Maybe the, you know, health issue doesn't become as much of a thing because there's not so much stress when it comes to like, you know, what am I doing this for? If, you know, people don't recognize what I've been to the group. And indeed, you know, it makes me think about Alan Wilder and Depeche Mode left in the late 90s by saying, um, his like parting message was that, you know, I spent a long time doing a lot of work in this group and not receiving um, as much appreciation for it as I should. I don't remember his exact wording, but he was basically saying he had done a lot of the the hard work for the like decade plus that he was in the group, but had constantly been treated as sort of like a secondary member. Um, so I get it, these kind of tensions, you know, they can simmer. So um, once again, credit to Aha for still being around today, uh, but also maybe the approach to songwriting that you two took would have been even better. Um, but yeah, um, I will say, um, while I again came to appreciate and support all three guys more through the film, I think I mentioned this in the actual watch along, I know I mentioned it in the comments, um, but that just, I came to like, I love you guys more than I did just having heard the songs, just having gone through the albums, just having heard about the concerts through the AHA family. Um, but I will say I especially love Paul for saying that he's willing to go through the pain, he's willing to go through the struggle, um, if it'll allow them to keep creating music. And you know, he's like, still writing songs, and I get it, like, the other guys should have a say on whether that full album that he had already written for Aha uh -huh, would become an album, and indeed, presumably, that's part of the story of True North, but um, I just, I, you, I think I even sort of remarked in that way at the time that it really inspired me and made me happy to hear him say that, like, look, it's not always great, it's sometimes frustrating, sometimes I feel like something that I worked on has been, you know, taken away from me or distorted, um, but I'm willing to go through that if it means we can create more music. And obviously, in the moment, in those interviews, the other two guys had variant opinions. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to give a shout to Paul for saying that, and the idea of wanting to create something even if it means a bit of sacrifice for yourself. I think that's a very admirable trait. So, um, yeah, and to say that even after the Foot of the Mountain incident, which, you know, obviously was a great pain to him and you know, was more impactful than the producer realized. So for him to say that, you know, at that point he still wanted to do that, um, I found impressive. And indeed, people told me that True North was, in a way, a response to the fractured depiction of the group that comes across, at least for a lot of the film. Though I would say, um, re-watching parts of the film, preparing to do this, the ending of the film does feel more optimistic and uplifting than maybe I even realized. Like, I sort of felt it at the end of the original watch-along, but... Um, I do think it suggests that the band isn't as broken as maybe it feels like for a lot of the films. So, um, that was my perspective on a second, um, watch through. But uh, people, again, they did comment that the band did True North on their own terms and not with the same film crew being involved because they, they didn't want it to be perceived in that same way. So again, fair, fair to them. Um... I did love seeing the the band crafting the acoustic version of Manhattan Skyline, Struggle and all. Um, you know, it's obviously Morton was frustrated and was letting the producer know it, and you know, Paul is kind of maybe just you know sitting uncomfortably, and you know, because of everything that's happened, maybe there's like tensions, but then you don't want to like you know pull on the the web because then that'll you know maybe cause problems. But Mags subtly, what if we try this, what if we do the vocals here and then you come in there and I love Morton, yeah, okay, well that would make a big difference, you know, like frustrated, upset, wanting to maybe not even use the tune, Mags makes a suggestion, you know what, that would make a big difference, okay, let's try it like that, and then to hear, I love, like, I love the song overall, like you could do so many different versions, I probably love it in every case, but I love that soft vocal version 
um, that we hear for the acoustic uh, rendering. Like, it's fantastic. It's a brilliant original. It's a brilliant acoustic version. So seeing that was like a really special moment for me. We're on the last page. Um, and indeed, shout out to Mags for the solution and personal navigation of the situation. Again, like, you work with people for that long, maybe you have a sense, you know, exactly what might help and what might not help to say there. So to say it and to say it the way he did it, I think that shows a lot of um, apt personal navigation as well as a musical solution. So yeah, uh, the ending of the film is even more um, well done to me than I realized at first. Um, and feels more positive for the future of Ha than much of the preceding film. Uh, so yeah, uh, I absolutely love the experience of watching it. It will continue to inform my audio reactions as we go forward, and I look forward to seeing more videos. Indeed, people mentioned there are other documentaries out there, so I look forward to seeing more of those. Ultimately, I have taken enough of your time, uh, but thank you for those who watch the watch along. Thank you for those who've been part of this AHA family and journey for like almost a year and a half now. Um, again, shout out to all those who become part of the Patreon, um, I was gonna say family, I feel like I should come up with a new name for that, the Patreon pals, gotta come up with something better. Uh, but no, honestly, um, that is very much appreciated as well. So um, big shout out to all of you, big shout out to AHA, uh -huh. big shout out to the documentary, big shout out to Graham again for sending it to me. Let me know what you think. I will see you next time. Peace.